I'm a shift shopper, and I mostly work nights because that's when most orders are available. I generally only accept orders in the zone closest to my home. One night, I decided I wanted to do one last order with a delivery window between 10 and 11 p.m. However, there weren't any available in my usual zone, so I figured I'd just pick one up on the other side of town to close out my day. During my shopping trip, many items on this customer's list were out of stock. He had specified on his account that he'd like to be contacted in that situation. I spent about 30 minutes shopping for him and sent him around 10 different texts about items that needed substitutes. Unfortunately, I didn't receive a reply until I was ready to check out. At that point, I reached out to him one last time, letting him know what was happening. He finally told me to use my best judgment, to which I replied, no problem. Fast forward to having all his items bagged and in my car. I sent him a text, informing him that I was headed his way and would be there in about 15 minutes, a routine I follow for all my customers. I reached his street, and I realized it wasn't in the best part of town, which I didn't know when I accepted the order because I hadn't been over that way since I moved to my current location. I thought, okay, no problem, just make it a quick drop off and get back home. Upon arriving at the house, I noticed the driveway was entirely on the left side of the house. There was a porch only on the right corner leading to the front door. I couldn't see the door from the driveway, and if someone was at the door, they wouldn't see me in the driveway either. Multiple porch lights and lights around the house leading to the door were all turned off. Keep in mind, I had notified this person that I was on my way, given him an estimated timeline, and even pressed a button in the shipped app to inform him of my arrival. At this point, I started feeling a knot in my stomach, and my hair stood on end. Before getting out of my car, I texted my boyfriend, telling him I felt really uncomfortable about the situation. The house was creeping me out, and I added that if he didn't hear from me about being on my way home, something might be wrong. The customer had ordered a lot of items, and since I was the one doing the delivery, it took me three separate trips to the porch and back to my car to unload everything. I carried as much as I could on the first trip, placed the groceries on the porch without knocking and making minimal noise, and then returned to my car for the next load. When I arrived at the porch for the second drop-off, I ascended the second step before looking up to make sure I could see in the dark. That's when I noticed the front door was now open and a man was standing there staring at me. He hadn't turned on any lights in his house, except for what looked like a single light fixture three rooms away. This created a faint backlight behind him, so I could only see his silhouette, not his face or even what he was wearing. Taken aback, I blurted out, Hello, how are you? He stood there and said nothing. He didn't reach for the bags, he just looked at me. I dropped off his bags, returned to my car for the last round of groceries, and barely made it up the porch steps. I dropped his groceries, turned around, and ran back to my car because he was still just standing in the doorway looking at me. I didn't receive a tip for that order, but I consider making it home safely that night to be my tip. Needless to say, I haven't shopped in that area again since. On my first summer back home from freshman year of college, I picked up a part-time job delivering pizza in a town around 30 minutes away from where I lived. The area, in rural Georgia, is known for having places that are in the middle of nowhere, and the pizza place's whole shtick was that it delivered to even the most remote areas imaginable within the town limits. It was getting fairly late at night, around 10.30 p.m., so I was confident at the time that I would be sent on no further calls before closing at 11. However, someone barely managed to miss the cutoff time, and our clerk accepted their order since they were so close. I was given the address and a single box of hot dough and sent on my way. The first red flag was the driveway, or rather, the lack thereof. There was a mailbox, but no actual driveway, not even gravel. It was just grass and a barely distinguishable trodden pathway that resembled more of a service trail than it did something frequently used. I bumped along, wondering if I was even en route to the place, when I saw a slightly above average sized house come over the horizon, horribly dilapidated and completely surrounded by overgrown woods. I guesstimated where the rest of the driveway led and ended up parking in a grassy patch that could have been the walkway just as easily as it could have been the front yard, headlights aimed towards the porch as per company policy. I walked up to the door but I believe that calling it a door is generous. 
It was a door frame, but the door itself was just a large slab of wood propped haphazardly against the side of the house, barely covering the entrance. This was red flag number two. The third and fourth red flag were also on the door. This included the A4 sheet of printer paper with the words, Around Back, scribbled in all caps, which was hanging just below the place where somebody had self-engraved the door with the title, Manson Family Ranch. Typically, I would never go around to the back of a house, especially a shady, unlit house, and especially, especially at night. However, it was my last drop of the day, and I was ready to get it over with and be on my way home. Against my better judgment, I traipsed around to the back of the house. The door back here was an actual door, but it was covered in both cobwebs and fresh spider webs. Clearly, this was a door that had not been used in some time. I found the cleanest area available and knocked. I counted to 45 and knocked again. There were no lights on in the house and I could hear no movement from inside. I knocked and counted again and repeated the sequence three more times before I was finally creeped enough to decide to return to my car. As I turned, I finally heard a voice coming from inside the house, clearly agitated, but I couldn't tell what they're saying. I tried to knock one more time, and as I was counting, I heard something in the woods behind me. It started out as just movement deep in the trees, but soon enough I could make out distinct running footsteps coming directly towards me through the bush. As I'm standing there, coming to terms with my impending demise, I follow the direction of the noise to the edge of the woods, which is around 15 feet away from me. In the moonlight, I could clearly see the woman who stepped out. She was relatively old, maybe in her 60s, I would guess. She had long, blonde gray hair, which was tangled and matted and hung down past her hips. She was in what looked to be originally a white nightgown, but at that time it was dingy and closer to a beigeish brown color. She was absolutely barefoot, and her feet were covered in dirt and what had to be blood, presumably due to the fact that she had just sprinted through the prickly woods where there was no trail to be seen. I never learned her name, but I still affectionately refer to her as Red Flag Number 5. She stopped short when she saw me and started to shake her head, no, eyes wide. I stood there like a terrified deer in the most fucked up headlights ever, as she took a few more steps towards me, reaching out to me, finger pointed. Her voice came out way stronger than mine would have at the time when she spoke. You know how southern people can either sound like loving grandmothers or backwoods murderers? Well, she sounded like the latter when she drawled, Oh no, no honey, no, you get on, you get, get on out of here. I wish I could say I listened, I ran, I left, but I was so in shock at how events were playing out that my own self-preservation was put on a back burner while I tried to figure out what was happening. She seemed to realize that I was not moving, even if I could not make my mouth move to ask her what was happening, or even what to do with the stupid pizza in my hands. She looked at me like she could have smacked the hell out of me right then and there and proceeded to deliver red flags 6 through 12. Darling, did you hear me? You deaf or dumb. Young girls like you come out here and then they don't get to leave. So I finally quit being the white person in a horror movie when I realized that this was not a funny little ghost story. This was 5 feet 3, 116 pounds me potentially being targeted to be robbed or kidnapped or worse. So I dropped the dumb little pizza and started running back to my car, which I had stupidly left on and unlocked as was usual for most of my deliveries. As I neared the car, I heard a slam from behind me, and I looked over my shoulder to see that the wooden door had been pushed over and had fallen into the porch beneath it. As I was closing the car door, an older man was limping down the front steps, waving his arms like an airplane runway attendant at me, calling me a little bitch, telling me to get out of the car now. At a loss for what to do, I called out something muttery and shaky, and along the lines of pizzas out back, I floored my dad's shitty little 90s Lexus and somehow managed to avoid trees on the odd trail back to the main road, which was still 12 miles and several turns from any road that actually had a name, let alone painted lines. I reported it to my manager, and he said he contacted police, but nothing ever came of it that I'm aware of. Either way, that was my first and hopefully last personal encounter with the self-proclaimed Manson Family Ranch. When I was in college, I got a job delivering pizzas late at night. Typically, I would work until about 2 a.m. It was a less than ideal job, and the shop itself was extremely dirty and unsanitary, falling apart in many places. However, 
I usually made really good tips, so it was worth it. At the time, I was 19 years old, and it was summertime in Colorado, so even at night it remained fairly warm. This was my second weekend on the job, so I was still getting used to it. I'm naturally a paranoid person, so my preference was to drop off the pizza, take my tip, and leave right away for the next delivery. I hardly ever went inside a customer's house. If I did, I would just step in briefly while leaving the door open. It was approaching midnight when I received a delivery to a house on the east side of town. It was supposed to be my last delivery of the night. I arrived at the house, and it looked relatively normal from the outside. The street was quite dark, but I didn't feel uncomfortable. I walked up to the door and knocked. A big, shirtless old man with a beer belly answered the door and told me to come inside. I immediately felt uneasy about him. I declined his invitation and attempted to give him his pizza right there. However, he insisted, Come inside, it's freezing out and we don't want the cold air coming in. This statement struck me as odd since it was summertime. Feeling nervous and not thinking clearly, I took one hesitant step inside his house, not going all the way in. He then urged me to come all the way in, citing the cold outside. At this point, I should have left, but I was panicking and not making rational decisions. I entered his house and he closed both the screen door and the main door behind me. Despite my instincts, I tried to convince myself that I was overreacting. He then called out to his wife that the pizza had arrived. I could see her in the kitchen, cooking. It seemed strange that she had ordered a pizza but was also preparing food herself. I glanced around their living room, only to find it completely filled with stuffed animals. The couches, tables, window sills, everything was covered. The sight gave me an eerie feeling. The wife walked into the living room holding something out in her hand. As she approached me, I realized it was some kind of bread or cake. She said, Eat this banana bread and don't worry, it's not poisonous. I was taken aback by the weird request. Politely declining, I lied, saying I was on a diet. She continued to hold the bread out to me, staring at me expectantly. I refused again, and this time I stopped trying to be polite, telling the couple that I needed to get back to work. Holding the pizza and contemplating whether I should just make a run for it, I felt extremely uncomfortable. Seeing that I wouldn't eat the bread, the wife returned to the kitchen, seemingly upset. The man then said, let me find some change for your tip. He started rummaging through the living room, searching for change to give me. I told him to forget about the tip and that I didn't need it. However, he insisted on finding a tip, even though most people have the tip ready upon delivery. As he continued searching for change among the stuffed animals, I began to suspect that they were trying to stall me for some reason. At this point, I was so anxious that I told the man I was leaving and began to open the door. He took the pizza from me and gave me a few quarters he had found. I left in a hurry and returned to the shop. I reported the incident to my supervisor, but he didn't seem to care. He just sent me on another delivery. I was frustrated with his response. I can't say for sure whether that couple was genuinely creepy or simply socially awkward, but I made sure I never delivered to that house again.